everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Pastor. Well, hey. Good morning. He's talking. He's he's social. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody that's here. Good morning, those of you that are at home. We're so excited to be here on the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Just ready, combined, joined as a family, ready to lift our hearts together and our voices together. Um, lifted straight up to the Savior this morning in thanksgiving for all that he has blessed us with, all the unexpected blessings that are about to come, and all his promises kept. So will you just stand up on our feet this morning and let's just lift our voices to the fount of every blessing, our Lord Jesus. So the last last verse there has that lyric that says, Lord, my soul, it wanders. I can feel it. It's prone to wandering. And especially in these times when we've been at home and we've been in quarantine and we've been protecting ourselves from each other and from all the chaos out in the world, um, our heart is prone to wander away from our family, away from our friends, away from everything that we're connected to, and away from God our Father. And so this morning it is our, our prayer of our hearts that we are fettered together and fettered to the Savior so that we can't wander away, but we just stay connected like a beautiful family of believers. So as you're looking in from home, and I don't know if you can see all the way into the wings or not, but um, and those of you that are here, we are full, full of Thanksgiving baskets. So full. So many baskets. So um, nine of our baskets have already been distributed, but all together we collected 45 Thanksgiving baskets for 31 families. So 31 families during this time, and this little church just rose to the occasion. You guys were amazing. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the gift cards. 
thank you for the names of families that we can bless as Redland Church of the Nazarene. So those families will get um, enough baskets to feed all that they have in their household. They will receive a devotional to help them get through the holidays. And they get a gift card to help them buy the meat that goes along with that. And they're going to get a greeting card that just says that the Redland Church of the Nazarene, the board, the staff, and the congregation um, wish them God's best blessings and um, during the holidays and always. So thank you for being part of all of that. And it's not, you know, it's the, the project isn't over. So we're going to be praying over these families today and praying over the food. But thank you, thank you for all that you did to make this possible and to bless these families. Sometimes this is what it takes to bring somebody to Jesus, to see that there's not, the world isn't full of hate, that there is a flicker of light out there, and it came from each one of us that helped out with these baskets or prayed over them or donated or whatever your role was. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. We're going to be praying over these families, like I said, and that they see the light of Jesus when that food walks through the door. So I just want to talk to you about a few other things that are coming up. Of course, we still have our Bible studies going on, women's, men's, youth, Jesus After Dark. Um, all of those are still meeting. You might want to just check in and see if your group is meeting this week during the holidays. Sometimes it gets a little crazy. But these are weekly meetings of prayer time and Bible study and fellowship. So um, if you have been thinking about trying one of those out, just check in with us. We'll give you the Zoom code and the time and the day, and we would love to have you join us. Also, we have this amazing opportunity to participate in a Christmas program with Renew Church, which is our sister church. They're actually our church plant. And um, we're going to join congregations, join worship teams, and we're going to put on this really amazing Christmas program um, on the morning of December 20th. So there's a few things that you need to do. If you're interested in participating in the Christmas program, and there's tons of things to do, singing, acting, sets, um, tech, rounding up and corralling the children, um, the costumes. There's, you know how it is back there. You're like, shh, shh, line up, line up. Where'd you go? No, you cannot go to the bathroom right now. You have to wait. All those things have to be done. And so even if you don't want to be on the stage, there's tons of things that can be done behind the scenes. And we just want lots and lots of participation from both congregations. So if you're interested, come see me or come to Renew. We can give you the address this afternoon at 545. We're going to have another meeting and a little practice and it's coming together. So I'm super excited. But don't think there's no job for you because there is a job for you. I promise. So just come see me and I'll make sure you get a job that you're comfortable with. The second thing that you can do is pray, pray, pray over this production because it's time that we are really, we're going to be making friends with this other congregation, seeing some people we haven't seen in a long time and meeting some new people. And it's just step one to doing more and more things together. So pray over the production and, um, and all the folks that are volunteering. That is something you can do if you're coming in the room or something you can do if you're worshiping from home. So start praying. It's called Once Upon a Christmas, and it's going to be super fun. And the next thing that you can do is put on your calendar, like right now, take out a paper and a pencil or your phone or wherever your calendar lives. And the production happens the morning of December 20th. And December 20th, there's something really important to know. We will not be having worship here. There's two services at Renew. One's at 9.15, I think, and the other one's at 10.45. And you can pick between those two, or you can worship at home, watch the production from home at 10.45. But we are not having worship here. We're meeting at Renew, or you can um, watch the Watch the event from home if that's what you're more comfortable with. So if you come here, you're going to be sad because the gate's going to be locked. And you're going to be like, where's my church? Is it Saturday? Is it Monday? What happened to church? So 
No church here on the 20th. We're going to be at Renew. And, and if you look up in the e-update, the address is there. The times are there. Everything's there. But we want you to participate. We want you to come. And we want you to invite. So if you say on a regular week, will you come to church? Here's the invitation to my regular worship service. People may say yes. They may say no. But if you're like, oh, oh, you have to see this Christmas program you have to come. Will you come with me? Will you come for me? Then people are going to say, okay, yeah, I'll come. I'll come celebrate Christmas with you. So we want to invite people too. So whether it's invite them to watch and you're sharing the link or invite them to come with you and sit with you as you're part of your family, we want to do that. So make a plan. Um, Stay tuned for some information as we're working out some angel tree ideas about how we can be a blessing again to families with some Christmas gifts and some other things that are coming up. Christmas Eve is going to be at 5 p.m. this year, 5 p.m. Christmas Eve, and it's going to be outside where we do our um, Easter sunrise. Thank you. <laughs> I was going Valentine's Day, Thanksgiving. Easter was coming. Our Easter sunrise service right here in this grassy area right outside. It's going to be dark and twinkly and candlelit and beautiful. So it's purposefully outside so that you folks at home can come and you folks in here can come and invite some people too. So we're, it's going to be beautiful right out here outside for Christmas Eve service, 5 p.m. on December 24th. All right, my friends, let's bow our heads together and let's pray. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you for these opportunities through the holidays to say thank you to you and to be a blessing to others. Thank you that you have poured down your generosity on us, Lord, so that we are able to bless someone else with the blessings that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, that you give us just what we need, just when we need it. That we don't have to worry about whether there's going to be enough. That we are blessed enough by you, Lord, that we can scoot over and make room at our table. We can open our wallet and give what we can. We can pray, pray, pray over a project, and you will bless our faithfulness. And, Lord, we just thank you, thank you for all of that. We thank you that you give us all that we need when we lift our voices and we lift your name, the powerful name of Jesus. Lord, we pray over the families watching today. We pray over the families in the room. And we pray for those that are already traveling during these holidays, Lord Jesus. Just will you just blow your the wind of mercy and grace through this room. Let us just know, Lord, that you're here with us. Put your hand on our shoulder. Fill our hearts with the confidence that you are the God of forgiveness of grace, and of overwhelming blessings. Lord, this morning, the words we lift are thank you and hallelujah to the Lord God Almighty. We love you. Amen. Will you stand as we continue in worship?
Yo no. 
God, how we need you. Oh, Lord, how we need you. Oh, Spirit, how we need you. Do you remember that old song we used to sing? Um, it was, Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. So simple. Jesus, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. Spirit, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. And how we need you this morning. How we need you. Every minute, every hour of our lives, we need you, Lord Jesus. We're asking with our hands up this morning, our hearts open for you to cover, Lord Jesus, all of the unspoken prayers in this room, all the private ones, the quiet ones, the ones people are dragging along with them that nobody knows about. And Lord, help people know that, help the people know, Lord Jesus, that you have got them covered. All we need to do is lift the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus says, I've got you. I know you. I love you. I adore you. Your needs are my needs. I know I've got you covered. Just what you need. Just when you need it. That's our Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for being our Savior today and for carrying those unspoken prayers for our family, for health, for work, for home, for our finances. For our fears and our unbelief, Lord, we bring it all to you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the God of everything. And we lift your name this morning. We love you with all of our hearts. Amen.
bless you. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Again, welcome, and welcome to Redland Church. Those of you online, uh, welcome as well. Uh, don't forget to thank, like, share, do what you do so God can reach even further out. Um, it's, just, it's just amazing what's going on around us. These baskets, you know, it was, a, it was a thought that in faith became a reality. And uh, it's just a blessing to know that uh, that. Redland Church is, is at it again, does it again, and there's 40 some odd baskets that we're going to bless the community with. And, and one thing we learned a long time ago, it's more than just the food. You know, it's, 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 it's all about the love that goes with it. It's all about, you know, uh, God shows up with these things. And so I was in a meeting the other day, and uh, the, the man's name was Pastor Josh, and and I was just like, just vision casting to him of, 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 of my ideas of what church is and, and how it should impact. And, and I shared some testimonies with him on, on what God has done with my life. And it was just, after about, he just let me go and go. And I just glorified God and glorified God. And, and after about 15 minutes, he looked at me and he goes, has anybody ever told you you're not Nazarene, you're Pentecostal? Because that's how big my God is, you know what I mean? And, and, and like, Mike, I don't just believe in God anymore, right? Because I know him. And when you know God, it, it, it's bigger than a belief. It's not a belief system anymore. I know God and I believe what he can do. You know what I mean? And so that's why, that's why the Bible says go and make disciples, not believers, because belief has its limitations, but when you know somebody, when they're that real, that they're that tangible, you can wrap your arms around them. They're there. They're alive. You know? And that's what my God is. My God is there. My God is alive. And so uh, when I talk about my God, when I speak about my God, when I share about my God, it's not a belief system that I'm sharing with. It's a reality and a real thing to me. You know? So it blesses me. And he's not the first to ever say that to me. You know? Because I do. I'll pray over inanimate objects. You know, like, like they're people, but God's powerful. You know what I mean? He spoke the world into existence. So therefore, his angels can walk right alongside these things. And when people go to eat, they feel the presence of God and say, hey, God's real. Not only do I believe now because God shows up every time, I'm starting to keep track. I'm starting to keep record. And we're going to get into that in the word today. It's just amazing, you know, and, and we're a part of Christ's body. He's the head, we're the body. And so when we do things like this, it's powerful. It's powerful. And it may take one basket, two baskets, ten baskets. God only knows how many baskets it takes. But people come to realization that their God loves them. And there's people out there that are serving their God. And then that meals are manifest. And so, please join me. We're going we're gonna to pray for our church, and we're going to pray for these baskets, and we're going to pray that these baskets aren't just filling, filling bellies, they're filling souls, you know what I mean? And people, people come to the, the realization that their God loves them. And sometimes it's going to be a God they don't even know exists, because that's out there. That's out there right now. People don't even recognize God. They're like, man, they recognize the need, but they don't know what that need is, and they seek it out in all these other things. In worldly, fleshly things, right? They don't realize what it is they need. And maybe a simple basket will re reveal to them that it's bigger, it's mightier than just a belly full of food. You know the old saying, teach a, fish, a man to fish? No, give a man a fish he eats for a day, teach him how to fish he eats for a lifetime. Right? You teach a man how to how to fill his belly with love, and maybe then he's going to learn how to love for a lifetime. It all transpires. Our God is great. So join me in prayer. We're going to pray over these, these baskets and just ask God to use them in a powerful ministry way, if not just for our church, but other churches that people would come to know him. So, Father God, we love you. 
We thank you that you are good. We thank you for these, these baskets full of foods. These ones that are here and the ones that have already went out, Lord Jesus. We ask that your hand would be upon them. Lord, we ask that you would open eyes and hearts as these people eat this food. May it be like the manna of years ago, Lord, that they would just cherish it. It would be like the food of angels. And when they eat this, they say, you know what? This food's special. This food comes from my God. Well, this food from, comes from a God I know not, but I want to know now. So, Father, I pray you anoint these baskets. Lord, I lift up these families. Father, they're in a place where they have to ask or, or people have, who love them have to uh, just, just say, hey, this family needs a basket. So uh, they're probably not functioning all that well. They maybe, maybe have holes in, in their finances, Lord, that they, but Lord, they find themselves in a need and you're filling it. And Lord, I just thank you that you gave us the opportunity to do that. But it's all for your glory. So I lift up these households. I lift up these heads of the households, Lord. I pray, I pray protection over them. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, uh, bless their bodies with good health. Father, Father, strong minds. And Lord, give them opportunity to provide. And Father, as you open a door, I pray that they would walk through it. And Lord, that they would carry their families. And Lord, these people who maybe don't even know you, Lord, that they would become powerful, powerful spiritual leaders in their home, all from one basket. Lord, you fed 5,000 with a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. This is no different, Lord. Multiply this food. Bless their bellies and their spirits. And Father, let them know you, you love them so much. So I pray for your spirit to just overcome the recipients of all these baskets. And Lord, that their, their hearts would be changed and their eyes would be open and they would just come to know you even more. Not just believe, but come to know you. Father, we love you. Be welcome in this place. I lift up our church. I lift up the leaders. Father, I lift up our country. Father, we continually see that we need you more now than we've ever needed you in all aspects. Lord, I pray that more people, more followers of you would just come to the realization maybe we can't control what happens on the outside, but Father, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Lord, there's power in that. So be welcome in this place. I thank you for what you do. I thank you for your faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Whew, God is good. Hmm. So today we're going to look into the power of thankfulness. And, and for me, growing up, I guess I can't, I'm not ashamed to say it anymore, I was very selfish, you know, because I always had the, a bad case of the wants, you know, I want this, I want this. My needs were always met, but I always wanted more, I always wanted beyond, I always wanted in excess, and I really didn't know what being grateful was all about until later in life when I surrendered my life to Christ and and he revealed to me how, how wealthy I truly was, how rich in love I was, how rich in joy I was, how rich in family I was, and all these things. But you know, it could be right there, right in front of your face. And if, if, you, if you're not willing to see, if you don't have eyes to see, you'll never see. And you look beyond all these, these riches that God blessed you with. And I remember, and I've said it time and time again, that we grew up poor. And sometimes I think it was better because in, 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 our, in our lives without, we had more God. We had more time for God. And we could realize God's blessings instantly. We didn't have to guess if it was our own hands or God's hands. And so given the opportunity to become a pastor and, and spend more time devoted to him instead of things that maybe I used to want, I've grown in my relationship with him and, and no longer, even now, in my older age, I see that everything has his hand on it and it's such a beautiful thing. So I wanted to share about Thanksgiving this week. And so in my, I was studying, you know, verses on Thanksgiving and I came across this lady's article and this lady's name is Lisa Apello or yeah, Apello, I think it is. And so I'm reading her article or her blog, and it's just like, whoa, this is it. This is what we need to come to the realization about. 
And so, so I start reading it, and I said, you know, I want to know more about this lady. And I start reading about her, and come to find out, she was, a, she was like a, a professional woman with seven children. Uh, she, she married her high school sweetheart. Life was perfect. She loved her job. She loved her family. She loved her kids. And then her, her husband dies at, at an untimely age, young. I believe it was in the 40s. And so this woman, right, who had, seemed like she had, her world was perfect. Her world was perfect. Got turned upside down. But yet, this is what she had to say. She says, and this was, this was part of her self-introduction into her blog, to, so you could get to know her. She, told, said a, she said a lot about the other stuff, but this is what stuck out to me. She says, I have always loved the Lord but I'm in love all over again. And this is after the crisis. God faithfully meets our deepest needs, but it's our task to have the eyes to see him, the ears to hear him, so that we won't never miss a thing. Can you imagine that after the tragedy in life that she had, right? She says, you know, I always loved the Lord, but now I'm so madly in love with him again, and even more so. And it's, we're tasked with the duty to hear and see him daily. And when we can do that, we won't miss out on anything. And so I'm going to be going through 12, 12 gratitudes that she says are very important. 12 gratitudes that will draw us closer to God. And in that, she gives us 12 scriptures to back it up. And she says, having gravi- gratitude will enable us to see God and hear God like never before. And so the first, grat- she, says, she says, gratitude glorifies God. So number one of the 12 is glor- uh, gratitude glorifies God. And she says, this alone should be the reason enough to thank God. Our, grat- our gratitude glorifies God as we exalt him, not our gifts. So when, we, when we're thankful, we need to be thankful to the giver, not the gifts. This is like praising the miracle maker, not the miracle. You've heard that before, right? Because a lot of times we'll get so, so happy, so content, so, so just full of joy about the miracle he performed on us, forgetting about the miracle maker. When it's him, we should be thanking. It's him we should be glorifying She says, 2 Corinthians 4.15. And as as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving, and God will receive more and more glory. Right? So it's in in the grace of God. These people, in grace, in in the mercy of God, this food's going to go out to the people. And because of us, others are going to be blessed. And hopefully, they thank God, not us, because it's not about us. The second thing, gratitude helps us to see God. She says, gratitude opens our spiritual eyes. There's a beautiful cycle in giving God thanks. The more we thank Him, the more we see Him working in us and around us, and gratitude helps us sense God's presence, His personal care, and His perfect timing. If we're always looking out to thank God, if we're always out noticing what God's doing for us, we're always going to see him when he's there, and in that we're going to thank him, and his presence is going to be ever so powerful. I always tell the young people, keep track of what God does for you, and it's beautiful because I put this in the notes first, and she comes back to say that exact same thing. You can't be grateful if you don't know who to be grateful to. And she quotes James 1, 16 and 17, 17. She says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Every good and perfect gift comes from our heavenly Father. Sometimes, sometimes you know what, we'll try and force his hand. Dave Ramsey talks about, you know, like, God, if it's your will, 
I want to be able to buy this new vehicle. And then you go down there and you twist numbers and you bend backwards and, 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 the, and the finance guy makes it happen, right? And you end up with a car you can't afford and you drive out and talking about, God, you're so amazing, you made this happen. And he's like, girl, you're heading, or boy, you're heading for a train wreck in about three months. I ain't have nothing to do with that. That is not a good and perfect gift, right? And we've done that. We do that. We make things happen, right? And then we're like, oh, Jesus, I got my brand new shiny whatever it is. Thank you. And he's like, child, you enslaved yourself. That is not a good and perfect gift. That did not come from me. So after five years of misery, I'll reveal to you what I had in store for you. You know what I mean? But I always loved that. That was a good takeaway from that, that Sometimes we try and make things happen, right, and try and point to God to be glorified in it, but really it's a train wreck that we've manifested in our own lives. Number three, gratitude puts us squarely in God's will. She says, we often take God's will, out, we often make God's will out to be some big mystical plan when, so, when sometimes it's simply obedience, as part of his will for us to be thankful, not just the sunny days, but on the hard ones as well. And uh, the realization that God loves us even in our messes, even in the messes of our lives, God loves us. That often ends up being the difference between being able to rebound from a major thing or not. Because no matter how bad it is, right? No matter how horrible these things are, and this lady can, can attest to that. Her whole world was shaken. But yet she could still walk in God's will of gratitude. Accepting. Maybe not liking, right? Maybe not happy about. But she's grateful that even in all this, God still loves her. And she quotes uh, 1 Theth Thessalonians 5.18. She says, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We, he know, we all know it's tough, right? It's easier said than done. If you're in a close, close relationship, it's definitely easier. He takes the sting away from so many things. Number four, gratitude brings peace. It says, count your blessings, not your sleep, not your sheep, sorry. <laughs> count your blessings, not your sheep. We're told to get rid of worry, keeping it, keep, we're told to get rid of the worry, we, worry that keeps us up at night. Gratitude helps us to see God's hand in all, God's hand is all over our circumstances. And God tells us when we can give him our thanks. And he can give us our, his supernatural thanks. The supernatural peace. Being able to be grateful to God brings peace. That peace that goes beyond understanding. People here, believers who have witnessed that or experienced that, people hear what believers say about that and they, don't, they can't grasp it. They can't understand it, right? Because that's the type of peace that you can't wrap your mind around. And until you've experienced that, you really can't understand it. And this is what Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to the Lord or to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Jesus Christ. It's like we're not, we don't even have to understand it. You know what I mean? I've told the youth, I've told people time and time again, I had some hardcore questions for God in my faith, in my spiritual development. And I said, these questions were like wedges. I can't go any further, Lord, unless you answer this question. And to me, theologically, Spiritually, they were huge, right? And so I get to this point, and I ask this question, and God answers it. And I'm like, all right. 
And he answers it so, he fulfills the answer so good, I forget what the question was. So it's no longer this stumbling block in my way. It's no longer this rock. It's no longer this wall. Because when God answers the question, the walls go away. And he answers them so fully, I don't even remember the question anymore. So there, is, there cannot be any doubt associated with a question I don't even have anymore. That's how amazing God is. And that's the peace that he brings. He brings the kind of peace that makes walls fall away and the doubt go along with them. Don't be anxious. Our God loves us. And then she talks about how gratitude draws us to God. Being grateful actually makes our relationship better and it gets us closer. She says, gratitude for the magnitude of God's undeserved kindness draws us to him. We see that when Jesus healed ten lepers. As Jesus walked by, all ten cried out for healing. Go show yourselves to the priest, Jesus commanded. And as they went, they were healed. Fingers were restored. Ulcers disappeared. As full sensation returned to their faces and their limbs. Certainly they were all happy, but only one was thankful. Only one came back to Jesus, fell at his feet, and he thanked him. And Luke 17, 17, 9 kind of comes back and he talks about that. And she quotes, she says, she says, Jesus asked, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. See, the leper got it right. I've seen this time and time again. People pray, right? They know something's wrong. You can see the worry, and our bodies don't lie to us most of the time. There's something wrong, and so they earnestly pray, God, touch me, heal me. I know I've seen it. And so God touches them and restores them. And then they go back to the doctor, get the good news, and they say, oh, what a coincidence. Maybe I was never sick, right? And so they're happy because they're no longer, their body's not shouting, hey, you're dying. Hey, you know, something's wrong. Hey, something's broken. The, the body's not shaking that anymore, yelling that anymore, so they're happy. And I've seen it firsthand, but they are not grateful. As a matter of fact, I glorify God more than they do. And I'm like, no, no, that was my Jesus that did that. You may not recognize it, but I do. That's my God that did that. And people were just like the other lepers. They were happy, but they, didn't, they weren't filled with this gratitude that draws them closer to God. Because trust me, when you come to the realization that it was God's touch that made you whole, you're going to want to hang out with God a lot more. You're going to want to talk to God a lot more, and you're going to want to thank Him a lot more. Number six, gratitude brings contentment. It's a big one in my life. It's said that gratitude makes what we have an, is enough. Gratitude makes what we have to be enough. If we aren't grateful with what God has given us, Giving us, giving us more will not satisfy us either. Being thankful is the key to contentment. In 1 Timothy 6, 6, 8, it says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we've brought nothing into this world, and neither can we carry anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing... We will be content in these things. Because to find contentment and, and godliness, it's like the full package. It's the absolute full package. It doesn't matter how big your house is. It doesn't matter if you even have a car. I often, you know, down in Costa Rica, a lot of people don't own a lot of stuff. So they walk and everything, and they got big smiles on their face. So I notice that. So now when I drive in the city, you know, they're building all these houses, these huge um, condominium complexes and everything i'm seeing more and more people walk right and i think you know what 
it would be hard pressed for me to walk around a block, much less, <laughs> much less walk. I mean, I, and you see these people with their uniforms on, so you know, like when they got a Burger King uniform on, you know they got a three, four mile hike just to get to work, right? And I'm like, God bless you, <laughs> you know. But the realization that that how blessed I am, how God has just poured his blessings out on me, and I'm just like, God bless you and thank you, Jesus, you know? I would walk three miles to feed my family, you know? And if I had to run, I'd run. But I just find myself thanking him so often. Being thankful is the key to contentment. And it doesn't matter what you have. If you do it with thanksgiving in your heart, you will finally find satisfaction. Remember the story I told a few months ago about how I was laying in my bedroom and bedroom and my master bath is bigger than the house we raised nine in? And I was scheming how to acquire more wealth. But I wanted to serve God, and I said, Lord, I know I can't serve two masters. Touch me. And when he touched me, the the scales were removed from my eyes, and I started weeping in my my gigantic California king bed. And I realized how wealthy I was. I got a beautiful wife, four children, a fleet of boats, a giant house. I started feeling guilty like ten people should, ten families should live in my house from where I come from, you know. But I needed his touch. I needed to come to this place where I could thank him like that. We all need to come to this place where we can thank him like that. In our much and in our little. Because I tell you, if you're experiencing having little, we serve a big God. He can fill all them voids. And I tell you, and I've said it time and time, man, we were so wealthy when we were poor. Because we had so much of God. And it was so easy to, for my mom and dad to share God with us because that's all we had. And it was enough. And so in our wealth, it makes it harder to show the kids, show our young ones, the second generation. The Bible's full of stories of how first generations that God, God was with, and they lived right. And it was easier for them because it was theirs. And then second generation experienced the hearsay. And so they grew apart a little bit. So when you're speaking to second generation, we got to be intentional to point to Jesus all the time in every aspect. Number seven, gratitude deepens, deepens our faith. Keeping a record of God's past faithfulness is a faith booster when we face new difficulties. And that's why I always tell the young people, keep track. And I never had a term for it until now. She says, my gratitude journals, I love that, are testimonies of my hardest days in my toughest circumstances. And God's record of faithfulness is 100%. So she calls them gratitude journals, right? I say keep track of what God does to you. She even names it, and she calls it a gratitude journal. And she says his record is still 100%. That's why God commanded Israel to remember his great deeds because it impacts. And Psalm 136.1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. This is so awesome because I, I always say, keep track of what our God has done for you. And now you know the name of it. It's a gratitude journal.
Number eight. This is big. Gratitude leads to joy. The overflow of gratitude is joy. Realizing God's abundant goodness, even in the hard, is a gateway for joy. Psalms 136 shows that so clearly as the Hebrew exiles sang for their thanks, sang their thanks to God for bringing them back to Israel. And she says, it's a psalm I pray in advance for years. And Psalm 126, 1 through 3 says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who, who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are all filled with joy. You know what? To receive blessings without gratitude, to me, I look at it as entitlement. And our young people are experiencing that a lot these days. I've seen it in my house, right? He has it, I want it. They have it, I should have it. Look, I don't care that them shoes are $400. Everybody else has them, I want them. Your limit's $40. Anything above that comes out of your pocket. Oh, you don't have money. $40 shoes it is, right? Entitlement. It's inside the church, it's outside the church, it's everywhere. And so people who receive blessings without having gratitude, I call it entitlement. And when we can replace that feeling of entitlement with gratitude, that's when you can truly feel the joy that God has for us. Because if my mom was alive today and you thought, that you deserved something or you were owed something, you and I could just take a ride over to her and say, hey, Mama, this person thinks they're entitled to something. Oh, yeah, bring them in here. Let's open up the book. <laughs> what is it you think you're entitled to, you know? I got that my whole life. I learned I'm not entitled to anything. My God's mercies are new every day, <laughs> every morning. And so I learned, right? I learned to change my feeling of entitlement to gratitude. And I quit serving myself. And you know, the moment I quit really focusing on my personal gain, and I, I focused on spiritual gain and actually doing great works for the Lord, I want to do whatever I can, whenever I can for Him. He's blessed me in all the other areas of my life. He is faithful, and if you keep track, you'll see in your gratitude journal, 100% of the time. Number nine's good, too. This lady's amazing. Gratitude defies Satan's lies. There's a lot of believers still don't, don't understand how we're at war every day. They don't understand that, you know, I would love to do this for the Lord, but I can't. And they're living a lie that Satan sold them, right? I'd love to be able to do this, but I can't. And the problem is, and I learned this a long time ago, we give Satan the power that he has. Because stronger is he, right? Bible says stronger is he overcame all this, right? So the only power Satan has in our life is the power we give him. You've heard the past doesn't define you, right? But he's always right there on your shoulder to remind you. Right? Like you're like, all right, that's it. I'm going to start living for the Lord, right? And you show up and you say, I'm going to work in the back. I'm going to sweep the bathroom so nobody sees me. And God says, no, I got bigger plans for you. You know? Come on out. No, Lord, people will see me. Come on out. You got a story. Don't you love me? You said you love me, right? I do, Lord. Come on out. I got work for you. Right? But the enemy's like, dude. Remember when we did this and we did that? You're such a hypocrite. You're a liar. You're going to go lie to them people like you? <laughs> are you kidding me? And then you're right. You're right. And so you listen to that voice that's in your head and on your shoulder. Remember, we talked about how most of the battles are won and lost up here. Right? They're all won and lost up here. And so 
people are defeated before they can even get started. Here's God saying, come, mighty warrior, and you're listening to this knucklehead in the back of your mind saying, warrior, <laughs> well, we know who you are, what you're about, right? And that's the old you. And there's some truth in that, the old person, the old, the old thing that you created is that. But God's word says he makes a new creation, that the old has passed away and the new has come, right? So that should not have power or that should not put you in bondage. So when this chump's on your shoulder saying, hey, I know where you were, say, yep, that was the old me. I don't just believe I have a relationship. I know him. Get off me, pump. Because that's all he is. He has no authority. Remember? Jesus kicked in the gates of hell or kicked them out. He didn't kick them in. He kicked them out. That means, you know what I mean? If you kick them in, then they can be shut again. If you kick them out, it's over. And Jesus said it on the cross. It's finished. Hmm. She says, Satan is so wise, wily, so Satan is so wily, he whispers that God isn't good, remember? And he's withholding good from us. But, it's his scheme, but his schemes are as old as the Garden of Eden, where he questioned Eve. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? When Eve responded, only the tree of good and evil was off limits. Satan suggested that God was keeping good from them. You will not certainly die, for God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In the garden that was perfect, that produced abundantly without work or weeding, Think about that. The garden was so perfect, it produced abundantly, and they didn't have to work for it. It was God's gift. Where every single plant but one had been given to Adam and Eve, but Satan focused on that one. Can you imagine, right? Aren't we spoiled brats? And we still are today, right? God says, you can have everything in these baskets it's all yours but please keep your hands off of this because if you eat this one you're gonna get instant bowel problems right and you're like man thank you god and here comes this this knucklehead right man I bet that one tastes the bestest. I know God said, don't eat that one because it's going to hurt your belly. And I know we got all this, but there's something about this one God doesn't want you to have, right? And you're like, yeah, what's the problem, God? I bet that one's delicious. I told you, it's going to give you a bellyache. No, nah, no, nah. surely it won't give you a bellyache. And so we forget all about the wealth and all the magnitude of, of his blessings, and we focus on this till it drives us insane. That's all we want. That's all we can concentrate on, right? You're over here eating some of the finest. Man, there's some good food up here, by the way. There's some really good food up here. And you're eating it, and you're, all you can do is focus on that, huh? How many times has that, that happened in our lives? It's like he blesses us so much. But yet all we want is that. You know, we got a car that runs and it fires up every time it's got new tires. But we look at that one and that's the one we want. If I only had that one. Right? And how many times in life have you suffered and you swindled deals to get the thing that you think God was blessing you with only to find out, you know, the only difference between this one and that one? That tame it. <laughs> Because I drive it to work, and I wave at people on the street that I'll never see again, and the radio's just as loud. Maybe even the gas mileage is less, so now you're going backwards. But you wanted that. And too, too many times in life, we do that. 
just because Satan likes to deceive us and make us think that's where it's at. And he does it with our young people all the time. God says, you know what? The marriage bed is full and bountiful and pleasurable. And Satan's like, man, sex ain't nothing but a handshake, really. You know? If you, if you really love them, sleep with them. If you really love her, sleep with them. And then you build a culture of that. And you never get to experience what God had in store for you and your, your spouse for the rest of your life. And how amazing it is. All for this. Don't listen to the liar. Don't listen to, to the deceiver. Psalm 84.11 says this. No good thing will be withheld from those who walk uprightly. No good thing will be withheld. When you can come to that place where even though your husband's died and you got to raise seven kids by yourself, you used to love your job, but now you got to homeschool. And you can still put this in to your blog that no good thing will be withheld from those who walk uprightly. That's powerful. That's the power of gratuity. I mean, gratitude. It's like, no good thing will be withheld from those who walk up. I mean, that's it. It's like, drop the mic, right? It's done. But you have to believe it. You have to own it. You have to accept it. Time warp. It's like, it's like I swear, two minutes ago, it was a half hour ago. So I'm going to go quick, all right? I'm sorry I'm keeping you on. If you are hungry, like Paul's always hungry, I'm sorry, Paul. You'll be there soon. All right, so, oh, gosh. So gratitude, gratitude, right, guards against envy. Envy makes, up, makes us want something somebody else has. I mean, she says, we make it, it makes it feel like we deserve it. But gratitude makes us realize God has given us far more than we deserve. Can you imagine that? Even in your, in, in your little, when you're truly grateful, you're like, man, God, you've given me so much. And it's relative, right? And she quotes Psalms 138.1. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will give you thanks with all my heart. Number 11, gratitude helps us live in the present. Whenever, where, wherever you are, be all there. That's John Elliott. He said that. Wherever you are, be all there. But that's difficult to do in the worry and rush of life. Gratitude helps uh, open our eyes and, and to the simple beauty of ordinary days. It lets us see the day. In this moment as gifts to enjoy the abundance right now. So she says, or I says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. When I was a kid, that song used to run through my house with my mom singing it all the time. And she'd be singing, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, right? Rejoice. And I'd be like, mama, mama, what's going on? She goes, man, I love Jesus. And he loves me. So it didn't matter if she was wiping or cleaning after seven kids. And we were pigs. I'm going to be honest with you. She often would rather bring the pig from outside than kick the kids out. Because she says, you guys are filthy. And we were. Sorry, Mama. But she used to be able to sing that, right? And it's Ecclesiastes 7.10 says, Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. King Solomon knew. You know, you got to live in the present, not the past. It don't matter how good or how bad the past was, you got to deal with the present. And do it with a song in your heart. And number 12, this is my favorite. Gratitude is a testimony, right? When we thank God openly and acknowledge what he has done for us, we proclaim a personal caring God to the world around us. We show that contentment and peace come not from what we have, but who we know. Contentment and peace comes from not what we have, 
but who we know. And that's powerful. It becomes history. We all know what his history is. It's his story. Gratitude is a testimony. And when we thank God openly and acknowledge what he's done for us, we proclaim a personal, caring God to the world around us. And we show that contentment and peace come not from what we have, but who we know. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Um, I didn't say my in closing thing. So in closing, we're going to stand. We're going to worship for one more song, right? And uh, next week, I'm going to try and do this a little sh shorter. But, man, I just I love my Jesus, and I love standing up here telling you all about him. <laughs> Yeah.
so good. He is so good. And I, I hope in this thanksgiving season, you know, I wanted to do a, a message on gratitude because it's important. It's important as we go out there and we proclaim ourselves as Christ followers that we need to be thankful in every aspect of our lives. And like Miss Lisa, you know, she she's a living testament that no matter how upside down our world becomes, God still loves us. And there's always something, always something to be thankful for. So in this season, if you find yourself like, man, I don't have a lot to be thankful for. Well, I'm sorry about that maybe think or reach out we have a church phone you know we have people that can share with you we have people that can sit with you we have people who who can pray with you and if you find yourself in this spot where you you feel like you have no hope reach out to us because our Jesus overflows with hope and his burdens are light and he says if if you have heavy burdens bring them to me not mine are light I'll help carry them and we'll teach you how to give your burdens to him so in this Thanksgiving season, thank you so much for coming out. May God bless you abundantly. And if you need things, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We love you. Go in his peace. Thank you for coming out.